Good morning. Welcome to Our Ladies Bible and Share Time. And we have a very special morning planned. And I just want to thank you for tuning in and uh, praying that any technical difficulties that you may have with your Wi-Fi or anything like that will be taken care of and that you can just enjoy and be refreshed by this time. And um, I'm going to pray right now. Uh, for our speaker today, Patty Simmons, that will be sharing with us. She's the revivalist's wife and travels on the Red Team with Life Action Ministries. And I'm going to pray for her. And then we are going to be listening to a uh, or watching a video from Revive Our Hearts and hearing some testimonies. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you that you are our God. Lord, I thank you that you are our refuge and our strength and our help in time of trouble. God, I thank you that you are our strong tower and that we can run to you and are safe. God, I thank you for the message that you have through Patty this morning. And God, I pray that it would be an encouragement, a refreshment, but God, that you would also pinpoint sins, areas of disobedience, things in our hearts, God, that you know about that we need, to, we need to get right with you about. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The last nine years, I've been going through some really big trials. I just became really angry with, with God and got older and decided I wanted to live life the way I wanted to live life. I said, I cannot. I didn't marry for this. I am not. This is not for me. My youngest one was uh, diagnosed with um, a brain tumor. And uh, I was in some kind of um, trauma. And one of my friends just introduced Revive Our Hearts to me as a just resource to just listen to and get comfort. I did not know that there was a culture of Christ out there that did anything like this. I had no idea. I had no concept of it. But I do now. <laughs> I do now. If it wasn't for Revive Our Hearts, I think I would have been divorced. I have began listening to the Revive Our Hearts podcast, and it's been like extreme makeover, mind and heart edition. I walked into that conference one person, and I walked out a totally different person. I went to truewoman.com, and I've, I've listened to, I think, all there is to, to listen. It really uh, helped me to understand that my role as a mother and my role as a wife are not menial in any way, shape, or form. I um, bought all the books in the bookstore in South Africa from Nancy and I, I spread it. The ministry was, a, was an answered prayer. It always reminds me and takes me back to the Word of God. Revive Our Hearts is raw truth. I've learned how to have true joy in the middle of these trials, and a lot of this teaching has just come from Revive Our Hearts. It's helped me to thrive just by pointing me to the truth. I can be in the middle of the jungle and listening to Nancy, and there's been many a day when I've been in my kitchen and I have tears streaming down my face because I'm feeling so ministered to. I love the fact that it doesn't make me dependent on a person, a book, but on the Word. It's so Bible-based that it doesn't matter where I am. It just ignites in me this desire to love Christ. All right, welcome. My name is Patty Simmons, and I realize this is different for me doing this live streamed, but um, a lot of you don't know me and haven't gotten to meet me. And my husband is Greg Simmons, who's the lead revivalist for the Red Team for Life Action Ministries. And um, uh, you don't know, maybe even you haven't even been to the church and seen our setup here, but I live in a, the RV trailer, if you have, outside the ch in your church parking lot right now. 
And eight years ago, we moved into a 300 square foot trailer out of a 3,000 square foot house, which we sold and um, got rid of a lot of our stuff and stored some stuff. And, and it was quite a big change for us in, in our marriage and in our life. And so um, I'm just going to sit here today and pretend you're in my living room with me and we're just having a cup of coffee and talking. And um, so it was such a big change, and we like to uh, say that we can't play hide-and-seek anymore uh, like we could in our big house, because Greg had a man cave he could go to and get away from me. I had places I could go to get away from him, and we lost that when we moved into the trailer. There's no getting away from each other when you only have two living areas. We jokingly like to say we have an upstairs, but it's really just three steps up to the upper level, and so it just makes us feel a little better to do that. So it seems appropriate that today I'm going to talk about hide and seek. That's the topic that I'm talking about today. And I'm sure all of you have played hide and seek sometime in your life. It was my um, favorite thing to do uh, when I was one of my favorite games to play with my brothers. I was the oldest of three children. I had two younger brothers. And we loved to play hide and seek. And the way we played it was that we had a base and whoever was it, if they didn't tag you before you got to the base, you were safe at, on base. I know there's lots of different ways to play. That was the way we liked to play. And I was really an expert at hide and seek. I was very good at it. I think it's technically cheating in the game of hide and seek if you plan and find a place to hide before the counting happens, which is what I always did. And so I would have such good places to hide and they would look for me. But you know, it's really not fun to play the game of hide and seek and not be found, is it? I mean, I would be sitting in a really dark hidey hole somewhere and waiting and waiting and waiting, and my brothers just would never come and find me sometimes. And I would come out, and they were playing outside or riding bikes or doing something else. I'd be like, hey, we were playing hide and seek. And they'd be just like, we couldn't find you. You hide too good. And they would give up on me. So that kind of ruins it. But I loved playing hide and seek. My favorite time was to play it when my children were little, and they thought you couldn't see them when they're just right in the middle of the room with just a blanket over their head or something. And so we're going to just watch this cute little clip of um, Hide and Seek Done Badly by some young children, and then we'll get started. No, no, see behind here. Hide and about the future of laptop hide and seek. It doesn't seem too fun to me, but maybe that'll catch on. Well, the first time that we see hiding in the Bible, of course, is the very first man and woman, Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 3, we have an account of the fall, 
and the first sin and separation from God. I'm going to be reading all the passages. They'll be on the screen behind me, and they're all from the uh, English Standard Version, and uh, you're welcome to look them up in your Bible, or you can read along with me. Um, starting in Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? So humans, as humans, they didn't even make it to the third chapter of the Bible before they were already hiding from God. And God was calling to them and asking, where are you? But of course he knew where they were, actually physically hiding, but, and he knew what had happened. But when I'm talking about hiding places today, I'm talking about places that we can feel safe, places away from God, things that we think God doesn't know, things that we think we can hide. And like that base that I talked about in that game of hide and seek, we feel safe with that base. But notice I use the word we feel safe because aren't we really like those children in that funny video so many times that we think God doesn't really know what's going on in my life. He doesn't know uh, where I am. He doesn't understand where I am, just like Adam and Eve tried to hide with the fig leaves in the garden. And of course, he knew where they were. So we can choose our hiding places outside our Heavenly Father. But what we're doing really is not safe places. And our havens can really become our prisons instead of helpful. There's a book, um, and I have all the books listed on a slide at the end of the talk, but so you don't have to write them all down as I quickly mention them. But in Emily Freeman's book, um, Grace for the Good Girl, Letting Go of the Try Hard Life, she says, you see, we're probably all hiding either from something, we're hiding behind something, or we're hiding something, but we're still hiding. And uh, she also says that we, God really created us to hide, but not in a hiding place crafted by our own hands to get our own needs met. We were made to find our safe place in God. So maybe you're facing a challenge right now. There's, I couldn't even name all the challenges we could all be facing just by the few of you in this room even. But maybe there's a relationship problem and, or a confrontation with a person or a, just a wound in your heart that you just don't think you can bear anymore. Or maybe you have a difficult visit to the doctor or you're fearing that or a situation that you don't know how to handle. You're just really at your wit's end. Or maybe you have a job to apply for. or Maybe you have a move you need to make. Or maybe you just had too many things to do in one day, but no matter what it is, what can you do so that when the day is done and that challenge is passed, that you can really honestly say, I hid in the Lord during this, because God can be my hiding place. For me, my hiding places were very subtle and deceptive, and I didn't even know I was hiding away from God much of my life. So hide and seek isn't just a child's game, and I was still an expert at hiding, just like when I was a child. So I'm going to share with you some of my hiding places, and you have notes um, that you can take notes if you want to. And the first one I'm going to share about is the performance trap. In the performance trap, I think I must meet certain standards to earn God's approval. Meet certain standards to earn God's approval. Now, I'm just going to come out of hiding right now and tell you something about myself. I know you don't know me, and so here it goes. I'm a sinner. I fail. I get discouraged. I'm weak. I wander away from God sometimes in my heart. I need Jesus not just for past forgiveness, not just for future eternal salvation. I need him today, this moment, and every moment as my hiding place. Okay, I'm glad I got that over with. Now you know that about me, so I know I probably disappointed you, but I came to the realization when I was 15 years old that I was a sinner. And even though I had been raised in a church home, I realized when I was 15 that I had no relationship with, with Jesus. I knew a lot about him, but I didn't know him. So I believed in him at that moment and turned away from my sin and took his substitution for me on, my, on the cross. Took, he took my place. And at that moment, according to Colossians 3.3, what the Bible says is that at that moment, I was hidden in Christ. Colossians 3.3 says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. It's really neat when you start reading the scriptures and seeing how much this is in the, all through the scripture, Old and New Testament. So, but after that, the way that I operated in my life was I had to roll up my sleeves and try hard and harder all the time and hide from everybody what wasn't working out so well, which was a lot. 
Because in the performance trap, you see, I, I felt like I needed to be a super girl. And the truth is, I don't have a cape or a colorful spandex outfit, thank goodness, or I don't have superpowers. But super girls, see, we don't like weak. Strong is the only thing that's okay for us. We only like strong. And I found I was always looking for what's the secret ingredient, what's the formula, what's the key that I'm missing so that I can be strong and stay strong and not mess up anymore and not be needy. I wanted to be fixed, and I didn't want to be broken. The Supergirl gets discouraged when she fails again, and Supergirls don't get do-overs, do we? So I was a tired Supergirl, and I'll fix it myself, and as far as you can see, I have it all together, good girl in hiding. But the Lord was trying to show me that what I needed to do was to remain, remain hidden in him instead. You can only go so long in your own strength. So this hiding place was with me for a long time, and since I always had to be this good girl to maintain that supergirl image, I thought maybe the problem might have been partly with my definition of good. In that book that I mentioned by Emily Freeman, she, I got a lot of ideas from her about hiding places. She wrote a book about it, and she defines good so well. She's such a good writer. I'm going to read to you her quote about what good meant to her. See if you can relate. Good means I never mess up. Good means I weigh the perfect amount. Good means I can handle everything. I don't look like a fool, and I never lose my patience. Good means my husband will never be disappointed in me. My kids will always obey, and everyone basically likes me. Good means I am enough. My goodness is all about me. And not only do I want to be a good girl and a good Christian and a good wife and a good mom, I want to be those things in front of God and everyone. I want to be good and I want you to know it. And I know in my head that my definition of good is wrong, crazy even. Still left to my own resources, that is how I operate. And if I fail to live up to my own standard of good, I label myself a failure. But then something happens to maybe offer me a bit of encouragement and I find the strength to redouble my efforts at goodness and I feel empowered, and so I try again. And then I fail again, and I don't like to fail, and I certainly don't want you to know that I failed. And I've become embarrassed at the predictable pattern of defeat that my life has become. So now I can stand at the fork in the road, and I can try to figure out a way to continue making life work on my own, or I can admit defeat and accept Jesus' invitation to simply come. So are any of you at that fork in the road? Are you tired supergirls like I was at that point in my life, ready to let go of that try-hard life? You see, I'm a fixer-upper. Anybody ever seen that show, Fixer-Upper, Magnolia and all that? Where we're all fixer-uppers. We know we have faults and flaws. We bought a house in uh, the spring of 2016 in Fort Worth, Texas. After three years of living in a trailer only, we, that got old. And the third Christmas in the KO, I can't campground, Greg looked at me and said, we're going to find a house. Um, and I also had a grandchild that was being born, and I didn't, I didn't want to not have a grandma house for her to come to. So we bought this duplex. It was built in 1928, and we didn't see our side of the duplex until after we had bought it. I know that makes no sense to anybody, but uh, we had to be out on the road. We saw one side of the duplex, which my daughter and son-in-law rent from us, and we just, and there was renters in the other side. They wouldn't let us go in until we had a contract, and we had to leave. So we thought, well, I mean, I'm sure it's good. And my daughter and son-in-law looked at it, but um, it, it wasn't in good shape. As we actually moved in in June, it was a sad day when we w walked into our side, and it was not anything like my daughter's side had been. And we, there were holes in the floors and uh, a crooked hallway that felt like a fun house that you walk sideways down and um, cracks and just all kinds of things. And it was a sad day, but it still had potential. We were disappointed because it wasn't as good as we thought it was going to be, and we knew it was going to be a lot more money, and uh, Chip and Joanna weren't going to come and help us, and we didn't have their budget. So we thought, okay, do you... But, you know, I started realizing, even though... I, I love it now because it's been fixed up. Do you think, sometimes I think God looks at us that way. We think God thinks like we do. And we think, well, he saves us because he sees potential in us. And when I get them fixed up, man, they're gonna look, they're gonna be great. I'm really gonna love them a lot. But that's not what the Bible says. 
in Romans 5, 8, it says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus' blood didn't purchase us because of our performance, but because of his. We are all hidden in Jesus. So we're all stained, we're all broken, we all have cracks and things that need to be fixed and, and, and are unsightly. But Jesus' credit has been placed in our account. And so now when Jesus, when God looks at us, he sees Jesus when he looks at us. So just like Adam and Eve, we can walk in the garden with God and we don't have to be ashamed, just like they got to do before the sin came in the world. All because of him. So we are reconciled completely, and it's hard. that's a hard concept to grab a hold of, and it's like you have to preach the gospel to yourself every day to grab a hold of that totally. But he wants to be our refuge and our hiding place. So after each um, uh, hiding place that I talk about, I'm gonna ask a few questions, and maybe just it'll help you a little bit see if maybe that, if that hiding place, a performance trap is your hiding place. So, are you afraid to ask God to reveal to you what is truly in your heart? Are you wearing a mask in front of God or other people pretending to be something that you're not? Are you convinced you must earn God's acceptance and approval based on how you perform? Do you feel that God's often disappointed in you? I think if you answer yes to any of those questions, then maybe you're dealing with a performance trap in your life as well. A second hiding place I struggled with is busyness. Busyness is allowing the tyranny of the urgent to distract us from the things that really matter. The tyranny of the urgent. Uh, There's a story in Luke 10 about Mary and Martha. I'm going to start reading in uh, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Okay, let's think about this. Mary and Martha, they were sisters, and Jesus came to their house, and Martha welcomed him. Now, we know Jesus was not coming by himself. He always brought a huge entourage of people. She wasn't fixing dinner for Jesus. We we got to give Martha some slack. She was probably making lots of food, having to work really hard. And she was doing good things, right? Because serving is a good thing. Jesus was a servant. We all know Martha's. Maybe we are a Martha. But what was she distracted from? It says she was distracted with many things. That, That little line always hits my heart, hurts me sometimes. Could it be she was distracted from Jesus' teaching? Well, of course. I mean, she was busy. She couldn't stop and listen, but was she just distracted from Jesus himself? She obviously did not believe what Mary was doing, sitting at Jesus' feet, was as important as what she was doing, which was serving. So what did Jesus answer her? Martha, Martha. Now, I don't think he said it in a disappointing, condemning tone. I think he said it in a very loving way. Um, You know, it's never good when he has to say your name twice, though. You are anxious and you're troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. One thing is necessary, he said. Man, Martha should have gotten her notebook and pen and sat right there by Mary and found out what that was. That's a pretty big statement, one thing is necessary. We get to see it in Scripture and know now what that one thing was. So Martha, she thought sitting and listening was an inferior position. And she thought Mary should stop sitting and start doing. But Jesus reversed that. He said, you can serve after you sit. He was telling her that what Mary was doing was the most important thing. Jesus valued the other more, the good portion. And when Jesus speaks to you and teaches you, then you're changed and nothing can take that away from you. So sometimes the tyranny of the urgent can rob us of our most important priority. How often have you said, tomorrow I'll have more time? Uh, The next day that's coming, next season, I'll have more time. I know I'm busy right now, but tomorrow will be. And you think, okay, well, then you get the next corner, and you're like, well, tomorrow I'll have more time, and the next corner. And then you run out of corners at some point, and you've wasted so much time. 
So um, how about you? What are your many things that distract you? Um, I, before we're too hard on Martha, I want to give her a little bit of a break. Um, she um, invited Jesus into her home, and she was hospitable. And I hope all, I pray, that all of you have invited Jesus into your heart, that you've invited him to come and change your life and be the Lord. So just like Martha, like Jesus was sitting in her living room, he's sitting in your living room, in your heart right now. But how many of us, like Martha, were anxious and troubled about many things, and Jesus is sitting right in our living room? And we just keep walking right by him, and we're too busy to spend time with him. We're, not, we're too busy to let him make a difference in our lives and to be that hiding place that we need. One of my favorite, favorite verses is Psalm 73, 25. It says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So Mary chose that portion. So here's some questions. Is God enough for you? Is Jesus your good portion like Mary chose? Do we fill our lives with many things and hide from intimacy with Christ? Do you value that one thing that Jesus said was necessary? Is it easier for you to do things for God rather than spending time with him, himself? Another hiding place I struggle with is called the comfort zone. I know this hiding place all too well. I crave the comfort zone. A comfort zone is a situation or a position in which a person can feel secure, comfortable, or in control. We want to live in the comfort zone, otherwise we might have to deal with fear and anxiety and being uncomfortable. So, you see, the comfort zone for me is a patty-sized task. I'm comfortable with things I can handle all on my own instead of a God-sized task, which is what he almost always gives us, is a God-sized task, so that we don't remain comfortable and safe and have to depend on him. So getting out of your comfort zone can be a risk or a really big step, or it may be just a small one. Getting out of your comfort zone may just be reaching out when someone tells you a problem and, say, and saying, hey, can I just pray with you about that? Because I know God cares about you. That may be huge to you to get out of your comfort zone and do that. Getting out of your comfort zone may be humbling yourself and saying, um, I feel like there's something between us that's not right. I want us to be right. I want us to be reconciled. Can you tell me if I've done anything to hurt you or offend you? That might be huge to get out of your comfort zone in that way. But whatever... It is, getting out of your comfort zone is having a hearing heart, ready to obey, and asking God every day, what would you have me to do today? And whatever it is, the answer already is yes. So as long as I can remember, fear was one of my biggest struggles from the time I was a little girl. I wrestled with the Lord and said, please don't make me do this. <laughs> don't let me teach on fear. That's like, I'm too afraid to teach on fear. But um, that's just what he kept bringing to my mind. So when my youngest, um, I'm going to be sharing with you about how I hide, used to hide in fear more. When my youngest son left for college, I had this moment of insanity, and I bought this puppy. I was free and clear. All my kids had gone, which was not a happy time for me. But all our pets had either died or, you know, something. And um, so I bought this puppy. I just had to have something to cuddle with. And um, someone should have slapped me. There's our little dog. And uh, she's precious looking, and we affectionately called her our little monster. But oddly enough, God used this high-maintenance, ornery, stubborn, crazy, fearful, so fearful little dog to teach me about my fear. God will teach you any way he can get your attention. So she hated to go on walks. If we ever said she was going to go on a walk, she would run to somebody else and be like, save me, I don't want to go on a walk. And every time we went on a walk, it was me dragging her all the way away from the house. And as soon as we turned towards home, she dragged me all the way towards home. And every leaf rustle, every twig snap, if another dog passed us on the street, she just would go crazy and be choke herself to death to get away from those things and was always looking over her shoulder, so, so fearful. So one day, I know none of you talk to your pets out loud, but I was talking to her out loud. No one was around, but I was walking her, and she was doing all this jumping and scared-looking scared thing. And I said, and her name was Zuzu, and I said, Zuzu, don't you know that I'm here with you? Why, you're safe with me. Why are you so afraid? And, oh, God just had a megaphone to my heart that day and said, Patty, 
why are you so afraid? Uh, don't you know you're safe with me? Don't you know I know everything in your life? And oh, that really did me in. It's something I've never forgotten. And so I decided, you know, Lord, you're right. Anxiety can be an indicator that we are not trusting God in our life. Now, there's all reasons why you have anxiety, and I'm not saying that all the reasons for anxiety are these things, but it can be that we're not trusting God. And so I decided I needed to start treating my fear with scripturally. And so I, there was a book I'm recommending called Calm My Anxious Heart by Linda Dillo, and she states that women are worried and anxious for three basic reasons. It says the world is out of control, or families are out of control, or my life is out of control. I think we have trouble with control. Probably so. We can relate with any of those three areas. We also, she also says, we do have moments absolutely free from worry, and we call these brief respites panic. So here are some questions that might help you identify. Is that your hiding place that you feel more comfortable keeping your fear and anxiety instead of letting God help you? Are you afraid to fully commit yourself to God's will because he might ask you to do something hard? Are you trusting God and experiencing his peace in the middle of hard things? Are you afraid to step out on obedience because he might, you might fail? Well, there are as many hiding places as there are women in this room. I'm not trying to hit all of your hiding places. I'm just sharing with you my top three, and God shows me more all the time um, of ways that I choose to not hide in him. But let's look at how we do hide in him and ways that he's told us how to hide in him. And so let's look at, from the scripture, different ways that God says that he is a hiding place for us. Go ahead and show that slide. This is what God, these are words that God uses of himself in scripture that make us think of hiding places. Secret place, shelter, shadow, covering, refuge, fortress, rock, strong tower, shield, under his wings. And these are just a few, and these are just from the book of Psalms. They're all through scripture that God is trying to get our attention and show us that he is our hiding place. He's our refuge. He's our strength. Psalm 32, 7 says, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. So here are some ways that maybe might help you coming out of those hiding places and finding your safe place in God. The first one, then they're all very simple, really. First one is just to come to him. Be willing to be honest with God and yourself about where you're hiding and come out of hiding and come to him and be honest. He knows everything anyway. You're not hiding anything from him. I'm just going to share you uh, with you a little bit of how I came out of hiding and how God restored fellowship with him for me. And this is just something that happened to me starting in uh, 2010, one time of many that God's had me come back to him. And uh, so in 2010, I was facing that total empty nest for the first time. And I was dreading that. I'd always dreaded that when my nest would be empty. And my daughter had just married, and she, we lived in Texas, and she had moved to Chicago uh, with her husband. And my oldest son was in Finland as a missionary, and my youngest son was in college. And my idea of life as a mom, that nurturing time being over, was just horrible to me. I did not like that idea at all, and I was mad about it, and... I felt like God was really trying to get my attention and tell me that nurturing, just because that time of my life is over, nurturing isn't over. I, there's many people I can help and be with. But really, I didn't want to be comforted. I wanted to be mad about it, and I just was. So I just stayed that way, and I was just an emotional wreck about all this. Um, Greg and I had gotten distant from each other in our children's high school busy years. We weren't um, fighting or asking for divorces or any of those things, but we were just acting more like business partners um, in, a rela in our relationship. He did his thing, I did my thing, and I honestly just didn't know what his problem was. I felt like <laughs> I didn't want to be in the house all by myself with just him, and um, so we went to Michigan to a Life Action Seek Week. We were speaking part-time for Life Action at that time, substituting for revivalists, and God shined his light on my heart that week, and I became, began a new chapter in my life. See, I was a pastor's wife, I was a Sunday school teacher, a preschool music teacher, I mentored women, but I had a secret. And God showed me very clearly that I had left my first love, like Revelation 2 talks about. But see, I looked good on the outside. I was still a really good hider, could hide really well, but inside, really, I was a dry desert. 
I was playing this game of hide and seek and no one knew what a mess I was. I had come to the point in my life where I had no desire to spend time with God, to be in his word or to pray. I had walled myself into this fortress keeping God and Greg and everyone else out and I was afraid and hopeless all at the same time. But God brought me to the point of being honest with him and myself and I came out of hiding. He clearly spoke to my heart through this passage in John 15 um, that I was operating apart from him and I had a, had, um, a, a big problem because of that. So um, John 15, four through five says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And those words, you can do nothing, just stood out on the page to me that day. Um, and I know it's not a coincidence, but I think three different preachers that week all spoke on that passage. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm hearing you. So I realized I had had a lot of nothing days and weeks and months by living apart from him. Um, I had taught this truth about abiding. I had read books on it. But I was not operating that way. I was operating like I really didn't need him at all because I was distancing myself from God because I was unhappy about things in my life, how they were going. And God showed me that it was he himself who I needed. And I'd been working so hard in my own strength. And I confessed this was independence, and God has another word for it, which is pride. And um, I repented, and I turned away from that. I had no excuses. I had no defense. I was gloriously ruined. So I finally realized I didn't need just fixing in this area or that area of my life. I needed him. I needed Jesus. I needed that relationship to be renewed and revived. So I became desperate for the one who had called me and who would give me the grace to live out my life daily. So God's presence in his word became bread to me, and time with him was not a discipline but a water to my thirsty soul. So over the course of many months, I sought God. It was not an overnight change, and it's, and it's still... Um, I'm still learning and I'm still growing. Um, I read several books that really helped me and the only reason why I share all these books is because some, I meet many women that said this is my story and it helps them to be able to walk out of that lifestyle as well. Um, I read one book that's not on my list called Respectable Sins by Jerry Bridges which um, was really impactful to me. It's a book I'd had on my shelf for probably a couple of years and didn't want to read. It's like one of those really convicting books. Um, but God used it to show me my Pharisee's heart. And um, also, Lies Women Believe by Nancy DeMoss. God used both of those books. And when I say a Pharisee, I mean a Pharisee is someone who hides behind this mask of goodness and laws to earn God's approval and pleasure, but doesn't really have any part of Jesus himself to make a change in, our, in your heart and trust in your own strength. So um, because of these changes that God began in my heart, God also began a reviving work in our marriage. And when I say a Pharisee's heart, a lot of it, there were many areas God showed me I had a Pharisee's heart, but one of the major ones was towards my husband. I say every man's dream is to get married, <clears throat> to have his own very personal a Pharisee wife that can tell him whatever is wrong with him, whatever he needs to do better, how to change and how to be corrected and is always even secretly disappointed by many things that aren't happening even if I wasn't saying it out loud. Um, Proverbs 14, one says, the wisest of women builds her house but folly with her own hands te tears it down. And um, I'm not saying Greg wasn't doing anything wrong but God began in a place that I wasn't expecting and he began um, with the question, what is it like to be married to you, Patty? And that was a hard question to see. So God began working on that log that was in my eye, like Matthew 7 says, and I had to honestly look at um, Matthew. It's Matthew 7, 3 through 5, if you want to look that up later. But it says, before you can take the speck out of your brother's eye, you have to take the log out of your eye. And I'm still taking logs out. I still haven't been able to take the specks out yet, so I'm still working on that. So I attended a True Woman conference. It was held in Dallas area. And that's a Revive Our Hearts conference. And um, I heard a woman named Kim Wagner share her, her testimony about her marriage. And she was a pastor's wife as well. And um, she helped me to realize by what she shared, I was very convicted 
I realized I wasn't a safe place for my husband to come to for encouragement and love. I had become critical and nagging and cold and unloving towards him and disappointed in him. And uh, she shared that story as well. And, it, and uh, she has a book now called Fierce Women that contains her testimony, which is really powerful. And, and her video um, is called um, Kim's Marriage Miracle, if you want to look it up on Revive Our Hearts um, as well. But anyway, God really convicted me, and I came back from that conference, and I had to um, ask God, ask Greg to forgive me, and ask God to forgive me, of course. And we went through some counseling, and God began a revival in our marriage, and it was not an overnight change. Um, it was probably about a year of changing, of God changing us. But I can tell you the rest of the story now, um, more than 10 years later, that desire not to lose the nurturing uh, time that I had with my children. I travel now with 22 young people and a family with four children, and I'm so sorry, I can't look at you guys now. <laughs> I'm so thankful for that, that God provided for that desire. I can wholeheartedly say that Greg and my marriage is better than it's been in 39 years, still growing. We're on a grand adventure of ministry in travel together, watching in wonder that God can use broken people to minister to broken people. So we praise God for that. So step one is to come. <clears throat> step, and this, these aren't steps. I don't want to give you steps because if you're like me, you love steps, and I, I don't allow myself to have too many steps now. These are ways that God can use us. The second one is to pray, and that sounds like a very simple and uh, statement, but I, spent, I realized how many times I spent time thinking and not praying. I spent a lot of time thinking, a lot more time thinking than I did praying about things. So now, how do I live? I live, I pray for God's help. I'm very specific. Oh, Lord, please help me to love that person. Please help me because that is so annoying right now, and I know I'm not going to react in the right way. Please help me not to be bitter. Help me not to walk away from you again. Um, Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart to him. God is a refuge for us. Have you ever poured out your heart to God? If you haven't, he wants you to. He asks for us to. Your best friend or your husband or your boyfriend, they can't always take it, <laughs> take all the stuff we need to pour out, but God wants us to. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, when, God, when Paul was asking him to, for help, he told God, uh, God told Paul, my power is made perfect in your weakness. So all of us tire supergirls, we can fold up our capes. It doesn't depend on us. He is strong. So the third way we can hide in God is to trust. And trust is placing my trust in God rather than myself or others or anything else. Trust is not a passive thing. It's not just a thing we do in our mind. It's an active, disciplined, tactical maneuver in our fight of faith because we're in a battle. For example, I have that struggle with fear and anxiety, so I've learned the opposite of fear is faith. And the essence of faith is trust. So whenever I catch myself having unbelief in my heart, I know that I'm hardening my heart and I'm beginning to have distrust again. 1 Peter 5.7 is one of my favorites. It says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. I'm going to show you a picture of uh, a sheep that they found that had been hiding in uh, Australia for six years without a shepherd. It had been hiding in caves for six years, and when they found him, this is what he looked like. And they sheared him, and he had 60 pounds of wool on him. They had to actually put him to sleep to shear him. Um, because the wool would tear his skin if they had sheared him with it on him. So, but you know, I love that picture because I'm a word picture person anyway that helps me to visualize things. And I think that's what we look like when we're carrying things that we never were meant to carry about our future, about our present, about our past, all those things that God never meant for us to carry. And he says, cast your cares on me. And um, Psalm 23 talks about our relationship with God, that he is our shepherd. And nowhere does it say that we need to still our own waters and that we can restore our own souls. He's the one, the shepherd has to do that for us. So now how do I live? What does trust look like? I have verses on my phone. I have verses on my wall. If you go to my trailer, you'll see verses all over my wall, my mirrors. And um, I know that there, there are verses about areas that I'm dealing with right then in my life that I need to see God's word in front of me. And it's an arsenal of promises that I can fight for him, for the faith. So 
one of my favorites is Isaiah 41.10. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And then um, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, I think is the first verse I memorized when I became a Christian on my own. But um, it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So by God's word, I'm developing a pattern or a habit of trust to get rid of the habit of being anxious instead. So the fourth way that we can uh, learn to walk differently and hide in him is abiding. And that's just to have a conscious dependence on Christ. Um, another word for abide would be just to remain or dwell with him. Um, I heard a Bible teacher, woman Bible teacher one time say that she's within two or three days of falling back into the pit if she doesn't have God's word in her life. And that's the way that I try to live my life now that I know that I can't afford to just take some days off and that it's not a legalistic thing, it's a need. I know I need his word to tell me the truth. Um, I don't want to go back to that place where I was. Um, John 15, 7 is, says that if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And then uh, Psalm 119.11 says, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I like Emily Freeman says, To remain in him means to refuse to get up from his lap. And I like that picture a lot. So um, I know that, um, I don't usually say this, but you know how your computer has a default setting and um, it goes back to this screensaver when you let it sit for a while? Well, I just don't want to give you the impression that, like, I defeated all these things and I don't struggle with these things anymore. I think default means you start trying to coast and walk without him and do things on your own. And then you'll find you have these areas that creep back into your life over and over again. And Colossians 3, 23, 2 and 3 says, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So we remain hidden. We continue fighting. We continue doing all these things. And um, so I'm praying that after today, or starting today, that you're lear going to learn to come to the Father and pray, calling out to him for help, and take refuge in his promises and trust him, and then learn to abide. And so let's stop hiding from God and be hidden in him instead, our only place of safety. We're going to look at a passage, Luke 8, and start with verse 43. And then after I read it and make a few comments, um, I'm going to have Olivia and Hudson come up and sing um, a song and share with you, and then the time will be over. And so um, I just want you to listen to this story. It's called uh, About a Hidden Woman. Verse 43, And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him, Jesus. She touched the fringe of his garment, and was immediately, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And then we're going to skip down to 47. It says, and when the woman saw she was not hidden, she came trembling. And falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So we as women can imagine what that woman's life would have been, 12 years of just hemorrhaging. And she'd been to all the doctors she could find, used all her money. And she was also an outcast from Jewish society. She couldn't even live with her family. She was treated essentially like a leper because of her discharge of blood. But this was not only a physical problem of weakness that she would have had. It was um, loneliness, and she was desperate. All she knew is Jesus was her last and only hope, that she knew what he could help her. So she touched the fringe of his garment. So she had to be almost down on her knees to touch the bottom of that garment. And she came up behind him so humble, and, but yet so needy. But Jesus wouldn't let her get by with that physical healing alone. Not, he didn't want any hit and run healing for Jesus that day. He asked, who touched me? He's all about relationship. He knew who had touched him, don't you think? But Jesus knew it, and God knew in the garden where Adam and Eve were hiding, but he was all about a relationship. He didn't want to leave that woman in hiding. Jesus didn't want to leave her there. He said, do you know he doesn't want to leave any of us in hiding? 
In verse 47, it says, when she saw she was not hidden, she came trembling and she fell down before him. So she saw she was not hidden anymore. Her illness, her, her problems were not hidden. But it's okay if you have to come trembling, but just come because we're not hidden either. Jesus' response to her was, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He called her daughter, so she wasn't only physically healed, her heart was healed as well, and she belonged to him now. So she could go in peace, and she was hidden no more. So that's really all he asked for us to do is, and my prayer is that you'll come out of hiding and sit at his feet and rest. So ladies, come out, come out wherever you are. of hiding your safety. to be frightened by intimacy. 